Okay, so if I'm just have your attention, please. Obviously, as you've been aware, you've been made aware of uh, who our guest speaker is. It's uh, Mr. Ken Barclay, who, uh, up until very recently, uh, was the corporate head of Royal Bank of Scotland. So he served on the board of directors of, of RBS. Um, obviously, a very famous and important company for Scotland and the Scottish economy, but also a world a world famous business as well. So you're taught, you're you're getting. Uh, experience, you're getting the, the viewpoint of someone who's who's done what we're learning about in the textbooks, who's actually li who's lived the, the, um, the, these experiences and who has operated at a very highest level uh, in the business world. So we've learned the theory, now this is the reality. So uh, Ken Barclay is going to address you. Right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all very much. I hope I didn't keep you waiting too long. Um, now, I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes or maybe a wee bit longer. It depends whether we get sidetracked into telling stories as much as anything else, because sometimes they're the other things that you'll remember as much as anything else. But I think the important part of today is as much to respond to some of the questions that I was given when I, when I came in, uh, but really to, to answer the questions that you've got as to what the things that are really relevant for you. And if I've gone off on too much of a tangent from the direction that you would like to go on, then make sure that you pull me back with the Q&A session that we have at the end of today. So it's great to be back. I was trying to remember when I was last here, but um, were any of you in the class that I did last time? Or maybe it was maybe slightly younger class. Anyway, Mr. Coyle asked me to talk about half a dozen different sort of areas. Um, and I'll come on to them in a moment or two. But what I found when I was thinking about what I'm going to say this morning was that actually they are so intertwined with the things that went right initially for the Royal Bank of Scotland and then subsequently, as you've all found out, went catastrophically wrong. But picking, picking any one particular area uh, and focusing on that, would perhaps you'd almost have to deal with all the other areas that he spoke about. So what he asked me to talk about was the image of the Royal Bank and its, um, and its reputation. So where were we and where are we now? He also asked me to touch on competition and technology. Those two, two are separate, competition and technology. The job opportunities that currently exist for young people, and I'll focus that on Scotland rather than across the rest of the countries in which we are here. So job opportunities and what we're doing about hiring people. Uh, he also asked me to touch on corporate social responsibility, often which cut short to CSR. I'll spend a bit of time on that because I think the world has changed and the way that we think of CSR now is very different from perhaps what it was a few years ago. And then the, growth, the story of the Royal Bank's growth and then the downsizing back to the, the way that we will be in the future. And, and as I mentioned, these issues are kind of all intertwined with one another. You can't really sort of pick one and then discount all the other areas. You'll find that, as I discuss them, I'll keep coming back to one thing that will come through the whole time that we're talking today, and that's really about customers. And what we'll find is that what went wrong at the Royal Bank of Scotland was that we stopped thinking about customers. And any business that takes its eye off the customer and starts to focus on other things, whatever walk of life they're involved in. And for example, a good example would be what happened at Volkswagen recently. You may have heard in the, read in the papers or heard in the television that they didn't tell the truth about the emissions that were coming from some of their diesel engines. Now, if they'd really thought about their customers right throughout all of that, they wouldn't have got into that situation. So that is the biggest learning that we've had over the last seven or eight years, that we subordinated the views of our customers to other things, and that's one thing that will ultimately lead in catastrophic failure for any company that ever does that in the future. So, you'll find that the customer comes through in the, in the five, five or six areas that uh, I was asked to, to have a look at. But let me start with reputation, because there is an old adage that many of you will have heard before, and that is that it takes a lifetime to build trust, it takes a lifetime to build a reputation whether that's in a relationship with other people or whether that's in a relationship with companies. But it takes a heartbeat to lose it. So you spend your entire life building up a reputation, and then something goes wrong and your reputation is in tatters. And then it takes another lifetime to rebuild it again. And that's the process through which we are all going at the present time. Now, having 
smashed it to smithereens in a relatively short space of time, we would recognize that we are probably not much more than halfway through the process, despite the fact that it started in 2008 or early 2009. That's seven years we've been at this, and I would expect that it could be as long as 20, 2020, 2022, uh, by the time we've been able to restore it back to where it was before. That's just a fact of life. That's the reality. 15 years it will take, certainly well, a lot longer than 10, to rebuild it. But this isn't just about bank failure, it's slightly more than that, because in the 290 years since the Royal Bank was founded in 1727, there have been many bank failures. Um, the, the, the conglomeration that became the Royal Bank of Scotland in the late 1960s was as a result of many mergers and acquisitions, many, many banks that had hadn't been successful were, were, were failing for, for a variety of different reasons. And the Royal Bank bought them and became quite a sizable organization between 1950 and 1970. Um, what was different this time, however, was, let me just recap just for a moment. The, the reason that many acquisitions took place within the banking industry was that there was a kind of unwritten rule if a bank gets into difficulty, it typically got taken over by another bank. They, they weren't typically just allowed to fail. It did happen, but more often than not, they would be amalgamated into, into another firm. This time in 2008, it was, it was quite significantly different. And the reason for that was that it wasn't private money that uh, had to come to the Royal Bank. It was public money. So that was one thing that changed it. And therefore, the public um, felt they needed to know and understand a lot more than perhaps had been the case in the past. Now, that was one thing. So public money was coming in, and therefore there was a duty of obligation on behalf of the management at the time to say a little bit more about what was going on. But I think the other thing that, that really happened around right about that time was that social media all of a sudden was becoming that much more of an issue, and people were able to post online their thoughts and, and views of this, coupled with the fact that we're in a world of 24-hour news. And when you've got 24-hour news as opposed to, if you think back a generation, you, you won't remember, but a generation ago you had 15 minutes of news in one news channel and that was kind of, that was what it was. And you've now got, so you've got news on the go for 24 hours and that time needs to be filled. And that in and of itself just made the story go on much longer and longer than otherwise it might have done in an earlier age. When you couple that with some bad behaviour, and I noticed a question when I came in about whether or not we were any worse or any better than other companies, and I'll come on to that a little bit later. But when you couple that with undoubtedly some things that were going wrong within the, the, the fabric of the organisation, some people were doing things, frankly, that were in their own best interest and not in their customers' best interests, then that got an awful lot of proof. And then eventually, people went to court, people got fined, and, and you might think, at long last, somebody was put behind bars for the things that went wrong. And I know that there are some people out there that think that that's the beginning of many more people need to, that happens to many more people. But let's sort of part that to one side. The fact, the fact that people were doing things in their own interest and not in the interest of their customers meant that, uh, you know, that got much more profile than the news, and quite, and quite rightly so. So the reputation was was undoubtedly damaged, damaged very quickly post-2008. And as I mentioned earlier, because we, what, what, what happened was that we subordinated the interests of our customers to the interests of our shareholders. That there are three main components in any business. One is the staff who work for the company. One is the customers with whom they do business. And the other is who owns the company, the shareholders who own the company. But the customer, in my view, and not everybody shares this view, but in my view, the customer needs to be number one. The value in our company is the present value of the, sh of the cash flows that you get from a customer interaction. Now, without going into what present value means, just in essence, the value of a company is the, the, the money that it generates from its customers. That's all it can be. And if you start disenfranchising your customers, it's, uh, you're on a very slippery slope. So the customer must be number one. But what happened in our organization was that we talked much more about shareholder value and shareholders and didn't really think about how that shareholder value was going to be created. So, the, the, but the only way you really value, you create value for your shareholders is 
and make, making sure that your customers are well looked after. You do more business with them and you do more profitable business with them. And then you create value in the future. So we are now putting customers at the forefront of everything that we do uh, because that's ultimately where we believe the value will come from. So let me give you a couple of examples of how that's manifested itself over the last year or two. Uh, for example, we will now not give customers who walk in off the street who are new to us a better deal than customers who've been with us for 20 or 30 or 40 years. Uh, you'll often see advertised in the, in the, in the television or in the newspapers or magazines or online about what great deals you can get if you come and do something with us today. Well, philosophically, we've taken a different view from that which is that we will not disadvantage customers who've been loyal to you against customers who've just walked in the door. Now, we've bro broken ranks with other banks as far as that's concerned, but fundamentally we think that's the right thing to do. And so, for example, an, an example of that would be that we will not give um, customers who come and buy a credit card from us a zero balance transfer. What does a zero balance transfer mean? It means that when you've got a credit card with another firm, you can move that debt, let's say it's £500, into another credit card and you don't have to pay interest on that for some, some companies are offering you two or even three years but you don't have to pay interest on that amount. We don't believe that's the right thing to do because fundamentally you can get caught in a trap as a result of that because if ever you get something for nothing, you can be rest assured you're paying somewhere else from it because economics just won't allow that to happen. Business economics wouldn't say, well, we'll give you the, all this service for nothing. You will get caught somewhere else. And we've said absolutely categorically that that's the wrong way to treat customers. That if we won't do that for existing customers, why should we, why could we ever do it for new customers? Um, so the, the, if, if, we, if we provide good service and transparency from our customers, then you would let, and we believe that that will then result in improved trust, which will then result in people saying good things about us and being advocates of what it is that we do. So that's kind of the reputation piece, and I'll happily take any questions that you've got about that later. But moving that on then to the competitive landscape that we all work in. Now, competition, to my mind, is a good thing. Uh, many comments have been made over recent years about the fact that there isn't enough competition because the big four banks, which is Lloyd's, which owns the Bank of Scotland, the Royal Bank of Scotland, which owns NatWest in England, HSBC and Barclays, control too much of the market. People say that's unhealthy from a competitive point of view. But I think wherever you go in the world, if you go and do research as to where, what sort of element, or what sort of component, or sorry, what, what percentage of the, uh, the market do the three or four biggest banks have in any country in the world, you'll find that it's usually between 80 and 90%. I'm not saying that's necessarily a good thing, but that's just kind of the way it is. But if you look at, if you look at the UK, where you pro the, the big four probably control 80% of the market, you've still got First Direct, which I'll talk a little bit about, and they disrupted the market. You've got the Co-op, Tesco, Virgin, Sainsbury's, they're pretty much online um, uh, co competitors but the building societies. And so there's an awful lot of companies that are set up now are offering bank, bank services and you can just, you can go online now and find access to, to finance from any one, any number of, of different uh, suppliers. What First Direct did, um, and, and I think I spoke about this to your, your uh, colleagues, your classmates uh, the last time I was here, was that they, in essence they've, they, don't, they don't have any branches. Um, what they have is a, a very good service offer on the phone. So you phone them up and they do a fantastic service for you. It's really, really simple. But they committed to making sure that if, the, if, you, if you ring them, the phone will be answered within three rings or they will phone you back within 15 minutes. They will deal with the issue that you've got there and then and make sure that you are satisfied. And if they won't, they will commit to solving your problem within 24 hours and so on. So just li very simple things that frustrate the life out of us if we can't get them solved. And they, they've done this extraordinarily well. And what you will find with customers that have gone to First Direct is that they will say great things about them. And if you think about where value comes, if people are prepared to think about the money that's spent on advertising, um, 
if somebody's doing your advertising for you, if somebody's doing saying great things about your company for you, then there is no better way to create value for that business. And that's what First Direct's um, customers do. They say great things about them and tell other people about their experiences. And it's become a fantastically successful company. But from a competitive point of view, if you've got a big market share, you might say, well, competition's a bad thing. I personally think competition's a very good thing. Because what it does, it does a couple of things. It makes sure that we raise our game um, because if you don't, you become complacent. It's a bit like saying, well, we'll just continue the way we're doing and we'll, we'll be fine. Well, that's complacency. Or you continue to say, look, we're going to get better at this and we're going to be better next year than we were this year. So I think it's good. Competition is good for consumers, but actually good for companies that are involved in a competitive market. Because at the end of the day, it forces, the competition forces uh, banks, and, and including RBS, to make sure that they are looking after their customers well, because if they don't look after them well, they'll lose them, because you as customers would then take their business elsewhere if you've not been well looked after. I'm going to touch a little bit about technology in a moment or two, but we've even got a situation now where um, you, may, you may have seen the, um, the mobile app that you can get on, smart, on smartphones now. And I'll talk about that. That, that's, that's the Royal Bank of Scotland app. You, you can do so many transactions with that now. Some banks have been started up and that's all they are. They're just apps. So that, what, there's a lot of money going into them. There's, there's, there's a good technological infrastructure behind them. But you won't be able to go and see someone or phone someone. That's, that's kind of it. That's how the banks have been established. So there, there's, a, there's a huge amount of change uh, taking place in the, in, in the competitive market. So there's a huge number of competitors coming into the market and uh, it's, it's, it's transforming the way that banks are going to behave. And I'll come on to technology on that point in just a moment or two. But I, I, what I would observe is that competition is increasing. It's a good thing. I see it as very positive because at the end of the day the beneficiaries of an increased competitive market will in fact be the consumers themselves. So um, let me touch on technology and uh, let me turn the clock back to when I started working in um, 1976, so nearly 40 years ago. 40 years ago, come July the 12th, Lucas just um, <laughs> The bank that I started working, I, I turned up, I rocked up at 9 o'clock in the morning and uh, we had a chat with a few people. 9.30, the doors of the branch opened and at 12.30 they closed so that we could all have our lunch just when everybody else in the world was also having their lunch and so they couldn't come to the bank because the bank was closed. And then at 1.30 the doors opened again as everybody else was going back to start work in the afternoon. And at 3.30 they closed. And on a good day at 4 o'clock we could all just go off home. I mean, we actually spent less time at work than many of you guys now spend at school. And that was kind of the world that we lived in. And, and you know, there was a certain inevitability looking back that that was completely and utterly unsustainable. We didn't have cash machines, so you couldn't go and put your card on the wall, you had to go into the bank and write a check out, but of course every time you went there, the budget place was closed. So it really wasn't a particularly customer friendly environment. There's been a lot of talk, you may have seen a uh, discussion in, in, uh, in, in the media about the fact that branches are closing, there's not as many of them as there used to be, and often these branches are in communities that, that were relying on, uh, on branches. But what we've done is we've, we've looked very carefully at branches that are open and we've monitored to monitor them to see well, what, what sort of footfall do they actually get. And it, it's decreasing all the time. So they've become uneconomic. And the reason they've become uneconomic is because of this sort of thing, where many, many people now are transacting all their uh, financial uh, welfare stuff on their on their on their smartphone or on their tablets. So the need to go into a bank is much much less. We've recently set up an arrangement with Apple Phone, uh, sorry, the Apple Watch, where you can, for those of you who are lucky enough to have one, and this is not Apple Watch, but you can 
You can go along and you can make small transactions up to £30 on an app. Apologies again, but we grateful Ed Girls from 2G could also come to the social media. So Girls from 2G, thank you. Do you just go through all day when you're doing lessons? Yeah. Like he throws terrible. <laughs> wow, well, just trying to just trying to concentrate. You've got an exam to do, and you're thinking about interruption. But so so what what's been transforming the way that the, the technology has developed over the last few years has been the fact that people are now doing transactions on on on, on your cell on cell phones. It's transforming the way that people are doing work, and it's transforming the way that businesses are working. Now. When I was here the last time, I remember telling the story about, I've talked about branches and there's fewer of them. What do you think the busiest, where the most transactions take, is the busiest branch of the Royal Bank of Scotland is now? Anybody, any ideas as to what the busiest <coughs> branch of the bank would be? Uh, the opportunity. Well, they'll certainly be busy in the town. Any other ideas? Think, think outside the box. Think sort of a bit left field. Come up with something else. It's actually a train. It's a train that goes from Reading to Paddington in London. Because the people on there, every morning at 7.30, are spending more time doing transactions on mobile phones than go into any other branch that we've got in our network right across the world. So that gives you a sense as to the way that technology is Meeting a, an un, a, a, is, is meeting a need that's clearly been there for some considerable time. So you can pay, if you go out, to, if you go out for a pizza on a Thursday or Friday night with your pals and you forget to take your money, but you've got your smartphone, you can now just send them the five or ten pounds or whatever it costs to, to their account and it's in there immediately. That's kind of the way that people are interacting. Cash will undoubtedly reduce in circulation over time, but it's, it's technology that's making it. Now, one of the things that you would think would be that, well, that's perhaps not a very significant barrier to entry. So that's why I mentioned earlier, app banks are being set up and all they're doing is they're developing an app and a, and a, and a healthy infrastructure that allows money to move around. But if you think about where the big banks are positioned, they've got the resources to be able to build good apps and good technology. So the question then would be, Will you, are you likely to go to an app-only bank, or would you go to a bank that's, that's, that's well known and it's out there on high street? Well, again, I'd come back to what you will do is that you'll go to a bank that's got a good reputation. So, you, as, as if you, whatever way you look at this, you can't get away from good customer service, strong reputation, trust, and then you can build a technological platform that allows you to do whatever needs to be done. The banks, the big banks, can certainly afford to do that. Uh, but they're not going to be successful unless they get their core messaging right and actually make sure that you, as customers, are well looked after. So we can't get away from that whole cycle that I talked about right at the beginning. So I was asked to talk also a little bit about opportunities. So people, um, apprenticeships, uh, what jobs uh, exist now in banking work and banking generally. Um, when I, when, I had a, when I was getting appraised on a regular basis, there were four things that, um, that my boss would look for for me. He would want to know, firstly, how the business was performing. So, uh, how, how are you getting on against the targets that we've set for you? What does your risk look like? So, is the risk profile of the business changing in any way, shape, or form? And if it is, what's causing that, whether it's positive or negative? Um, we want to get an update on what customers were saying about us and how they were responding, so how well we came on with customers. And we'd also talk about staff, the people that, the people that work with me and for me. And that would be measured by the quality of people that we had hired, what sort of, what sort of people, what sort of quality people we recruited, how good their morale was, how well they were engaged with the company, and what sort of prospects they had for the future. So who were the stars that were coming through the organization? So those are the things that we looked at, and we still look. About 25% of our time is still spent on where are, what's happening to our people, whether they're young, people, young folk like you, or whether they've been working for us for a long period of time. So I mentioned that I left school at 16. I started work when I was 17, near, nearly 40 years ago. Um, I failed my 
English higher uh, in fifth year, which wasn't a great moment for me. But I still was given the opportunity to go and work for the Royal Bank uh, after I left school, but to go to night school. And I did, I did higher English in high school. I was lucky enough to get some help with a former teacher and managed to pass. And then I was able to do my bank exams. In those days, you had to have a higher English and three hires in total before you could even go and do your bank exams. Um, but that, to my mind, is now the sorts of things that we're now describing as what I went through is now described as a kind of modern apprenticeship. Um, you're given, a, you've, got, you've got to study, you've got to pass exams, but you're given a great training opportunity. And so many companies, not just RPS, are doing fantastic things for young people like you. If, you know, if university's not for you, then the next best thing you can do, and I'm not suggesting it's an either or, but you know, one of the great things that you can do is you can get an apprenticeship in organisations now which will give you three or four years of really first class training. And at the end of it, you'll have uh, you'll become, in the case of if you join the Royal the, the Bank of Scotland, you become a, a chartered banker at the end of it. So it's really giving some great status to a huge amount of work and effort with prospective uh, employees that want to undertake. And we employ in Scotland, about 500 young people, and young people are, are uh, categorised as between uh, 18, 17 or 18 and 24 uh, every year. Um, and they'll do a variety of jobs, but I think the important thing is that we are going to take on, in the region of 50 to 100 uh, apprentices in Scotland uh, every year. Um, a lot of them in technology, a good number in technology, but right across the piece. Um, and that, to my mind, is the way that, uh, that we need to be engaging with the communities in which we operate in Europe. and we're out looking positively for young people like you to say, well, you know, art, is this something that you want to consider for a job or a career in the future? But if financial services more generally, there are so many companies now in Scotland performing a whole range of different kinds of financial services, not just banks, where there's a great opportunity if that was something that would appeal to me. We, at, we work closely with, um, with a charity called, it used to be called, it's called Career Ready. I think you might have some engagement. Anybody familiar with Career Ready, where they effectively what you do is you get a, a mentor from a private enterprise for two years, and you get work experience in between, um, in between the fifth and sixth year. And it allows you then to be in a far better position to to join a company that you've worked for. And I would certainly recommend each and every one of you to go and get work experience at any available opportunity. So, you know, we're now, in, we're now at the beginning of February. I would encourage you to be thinking about what are you going to do in the summer. Uh, now, getting, getting a job is not necessarily very easy. And getting a job with a specific firm for a two or three week period in the summer is tough. But the one thing it will allow you to do is be able to present your case to a future employer to say, I did work for this company, uh, even if you only get a very little money, I did work for this company, and I've got, I've got something from them that said I accomplished certain things when I was there. It's critically important to my mind that if you've got an opportunity for that, the opportunity to do that, you maximize that opportunity and, uh, and dig in and uh, get some work experience before that, that time. So as I say, my, my, um, my general observation around the people agenda is that if you, if you want to go to university, that's great. If you don't, try and get some work experience before the work opportunity comes along. And preferably in the line of business that you want to go into. Now that's, that, that I, I accept is not easy, um, but, but it gives, if you've got some work experience from somewhere, it gives a prospective employer less opportunity to say no, it's one less thing that they could uh, criticise you for. You can say, well, I've actually got them done. So, uh, that's, that's uh, employability for you. I wanted to talk also a little bit about CSR. I don't use that description any longer, I haven't done for a little while. But CSR, I think, was, a, was meant to be a panacea for all the ills of the, uh, the private sector, that we would just write a few checks out and give them to good causes and then everybody would view us in a slightly better light as a consequence. And that actually is what happened uh, for a long period of time. 
but but I, it, it's got a it's got a it's got a new name now, a new name to, to my mind, which which is which is really what's at the core of virtually everything I've been talking about this morning, and it's it's called sustainability. If you don't look after your customers, if they don't trust you, if you don't look after your employees and your prospective employees, um, if, if, you, if you don't do those sorts of things, then how, what sort of sustainable organisation do you have? If you don't look after the communities in which you serve customers, you're not going to have a sustainable organisation. So giving money away is fine, but it's not going to create long-term sustainability. And this is wider ranging than that, because this frankly is about culture change. Now I could stand up here, just stand here all day and talk about culture, and it's fundamentally that was what was wrong with financial services generally was that the culture was wrong. If going back to my point, if you've subordinated your customers to your shareholders, effectively you're saying your shareholders are more valuable than your customers. And there's something rotten in the culture, and that needs to change. And that stems, I think, that stems from a real belief in what is a sustainable organisation going to look and feel like when you go through the but what we do is that we we ask our people if they want to volunteer because we've got a huge amount of skills in our organisation. There's 50,000 people working in the UK, and a, a, a huge and broad array of skills exist. And what we've described that is is called a skills-based volunteering. So many of our people will go and volunteer for good causes, for local charities. In many respects, that is more valuable than giving them money because they're giving their time and giving their expertise um, and hopefully that will result in better outcomes for the charity itself. We give five days a year to every single one of our people, up to five days a year, for them to go and volunteer in local charities uh, for good causes. Um, that to my mind is, is a far more sustainable thing to be doing, not only for the charity but for our own organisation. So it's not just about cash. It's about what you're giving back into the local communities. We'll also help customers introduce, we'll introduce customers to other customers. And we'll have events where uh, businesses that are in the same kind of uh, line of work will get them to, or in the same supply chain. So what we'll try and do then is we'll, we'll, we'll introduce some of our customers to other customers to see whether or not they can work together. Uh, we are trying, when we procure our business, procure goods and services, we're trying to, we're going out to our customers and saying, how can we buy things from you that will make your business more sustainable? So it's those sorts of things in the round that are actually starting to make a big difference. And there's a recognition from our customers that we're doing we're doing the right thing. So whilst I believe that CSR, if you if you, if you know what that is, is important, there's a much bigger agenda around something that is to my mind critically important, which is how do you make sure that you sustain yourself into the future? So doing the right thing for your customers, for your communities as well, is undoubtedly going to sustain you well into the future. So to touch on, on growth, uh, I, what, I, what I'll talk about here is the growth of the Royal Bank and then the decline over the last uh, seven or eight years, and hopefully that will, uh, then I'll have plenty of time to go into to questions. Um, Growth from our bank came in multiple guises. Two main reasons, two, two main ways to grow are to do this organically by winning customers and using your retained earnings and your retained profits to do that. The other thing that you can do is buy companies, either by using your shares or using cash. So they're, they're called inorganic, sorry, they're called organic uh, growth and growth by acquisition. And now the it was around about nine, the mid 1980s when the Royal Bank started to expand very rapidly. So there was a, there was a 20 year period where there was a huge amount of growth. Um, first of all, it came from the start of the Direct Line, which is one of the biggest uh, household and car insurers in the UK. It's now an independent company listed on the stock market, but it was started in the mid 1980s. Um, we bought a bank called Citizens in the US in the, in the late 80s, and that has made multiple acquisitions in the intervening period, and that now too is separately listed in the New York Stock Exchange. But the big transaction that transformed the Royal Bank of Scotland was the acquisition of NatWest in 2000, so just about, just almost exactly 16 years ago. 
And the Royal Bank was able to buy NatWest because NatWest was beset by management problems. They just hadn't got the right quality of people at the top of their organisation and made some bad decisions. Because NatWest at that time was about two and a half times the size of the Royal Bank. And that was a transformational acquisition that took place that allowed us then to go off and make even more acquisitions because the stock market was saying these are, this has created a good value for us. But the, the deal that was too far was ABN AMRO. We bought ABN AMRO at Dutch Bank in 2008, and that was the one that effectively sent the Royal Bank of Scotland. We, did it, we, did, we made two, two fundamental errors. We bought it at the top of the market, so we paid too much for it. And the second thing is that we bought it for cash as opposed to buying it with shares. Now, I won't go into much detail around that simply because it would take half an hour to, to cover that issue off. But you increase risk if you buy assets for cash uh, rather than buying them with shares. And what we did was we bought it for cash. And it very quickly we started to unravel to the point where um, we had to be bailed out by, by the government. So we've, we've made a determination that we will become a much more UK-focused bank um, look at predominantly looking after UK businesses and UK consumers. Now, if we do that well, and I think we're well on the way to that, if we do that well and we concentrate on our core message and our core business, then I think we've got an opportunity to rebuild the reputation, recognising that we're only part of the way there and it will take some considerable time to get there. If we retain our competitive edge and make sure that we're delivering high quality products at competitive prices, with a good service delivery, then that will give us a good chance of getting there. If we continue to invest in technology, making sure that we're at the leading edge of that, if we hire good people, if we make investments in our local communities, then we can back full circle to the five or six things that I want to talk about at the outset. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. And I'll happily take any questions that you've got, or if you'd like to run through this list that I have here. I would observe that we were undoubtedly the post of China for everything that went wrong. And because we got the biggest bailout from the taxpayer, we were much more in focus. I think the industry did a big disservice to its customers. Uh, were we any worse or any better than any, anyone else? I, I'm not sure that we were. One of the things I remember talking to some uh, colleagues about several years ago was that if you went to Switzerland, and talk to uh, consumers in Switzerland, they would be very critical of the Swiss banks. And they wouldn't know anything that went on here. And so therefore, it's very much a question of saying, well, what, what are we fed? We weren't told very much about the German banks or the Swiss banks or the Italian banks or the Spanish banks. In our press, we were told about the Royal Bank of Scotland and the Bank of Scotland. It just so happened that the two big failures were Scottish banks, which again was felt more keenly by people in Scotland that otherwise would have been the case. And I think if you go to London, people are pretty much there because they, a lot of them work in financial services have, have sort of moved on many, many years ago. So to some extent it's down to the fact that the press will bring it up. And I'm not, but by no stretch of the imagination, am I blaming the press here. The press will, will raise the issue and it will be, it's sort of embedded within the, within the public conscious, consciousness, consciousness now to the point where I think there is a perception that we did more bad things. I'm not sure that necessarily we did, we did any worse or any better than anyone else, but it's just the fact that we got such a big bailout from the taxpayer that we became the poster child of uh, once we want. Now, you, you may have a different view, and if you've got a different view, I'm delighted to hear from you. We can have a, we can have a discussion about it. So that, is that okay for that one? Do, do, do you want me to follow up on you? Um, how, has, how much has High Street Banking changed? I, I think I've probably covered some of that off. Um, are the media, are media unfair to have yet? Well, well, hopefully I've said no. I think they, they've got to hold us to account. They, they, it's critically important that they do. That's the job. Do they go overboard? The media tend to go overboard to, 
what is quite badly, and they tend to go overboard and celebrate too much uh, when things are going well. But at the end of the day, they've got a job to do, which is to inform. And if they're, if they're doing that intelligently, I think that's good. If they're doing it without the facts, that's kind of disappointing, and that does happen from time to time. I've talked a little bit about improving our image. Uh, is it too big? Was it too big? Um, so RBS was the biggest bank in the world, um, and I, you know, yeah, that that frankly was far too big. We had two trillion pounds of assets. That's a thousand billion. That's, um, that's twelve zeros. Um, twelve, two, two and twelve zeros of pounds in our balance sheet. Yeah, that that frankly. If you, th if you think about the importance of banks in the world and how they are capitalised, uh, that was putting a huge strain um, not only on the whole of the UK economy, but you can imagine what would have happened if that strain had been placed on the Scottish economy. In, in, in the event that we had been independent at that time, and this is not meant to be a political point at all, but if the Royal Bank of Scotland had been in Scotland and Scotland had been an independent country, we would have brought the whole of Scotland from. Um, so that, that just gives you a sense as to how big we were and far too big. We're now focusing very much on the UK. So to give you a perspective, um, we, we will have, we had about two trillion of assets, we'll have about 300 billion when, um, when, the, when, this, when, the, when the downsizing of our future is complete. So that will be about a seventh, between a sixth and a seventh of the size that we were. Now, there's, there's the other side of this that I did mean to mention earlier what, is that so people will still, the press will still throw brickbats and many people will throw brickbats saying, well, we'll never get our money back. Well, it's going to be, if, it, if a conscious decision to become smaller is made by the politicians and the bank together, then there's a kind of inevitability that it will be very, very difficult to get the money back because you're, you're going to get the money back from a much smaller company. So if, if the company is a seventh the size that it used to be, the profits won't necessarily be a seventh, but they'll be significantly less. And so the ability of the, ability of the bank to be able to generate the profits that will get the money back to the taxpayers will be that much, diff much more, more difficult and it will take much longer to get. Good question. Uh, do you think banking will just depend on technology in the future? Just go back to. Do I think it will depend on technology? Just fill it. I th I think so. If if you're going to go and get a loan for a car or you want to go and buy a house, um, you probably want to speak to somebody about it. And, and I think it's important that you have got somebody to go into a branch and talk to them. About. If you want to review your finances or you want to look and see well I've got this money coming in and this money going out I need to discuss with somebody and it's not working out the way out. So getting some advice as to how you manage your money. I think it's important that you've got a person to have that discussion with them and not, and not a desktop computer. But on the other side there's no question that uh, there are fewer transactions taking place in branches now and many many more taking place on this. We've had somewhere in the region of 3 billion logons, 3 billion logons from our customers in If that, that, that's that's 3,000 million, right? So, so that didn't exist three years ago. So in, a, in answer to your question, in part, if we don't have a good mobile app, then your generation will just say, if they had it with that, we'll go down. So it's critically important that we invest in technology and make sure that we've got leading edge, leading edge capability. But equally, there is another side of our organisation which needs to be able to respond to customers who want to come and speak to us. But the, the another stat I could give you is that transactions across branch counters are down by about 40% since 2010. So there were, if there were 10 transactions taking place, 100 transactions taking place in a branch in 2010, there are only 60 taking place now. So the other, well, there's more, the other 40 is made up with more than that because there's probably many, many more transactions in total that have been taken out. So there's probably as many transactions taking place in branches as there are on cell phones. So yes, it's very important, but it's not the answer to it. Yeah. Hi. Um, see, uh, I understand that you're 
Right. So, so if, if so, the question was if, if we would we take people that have worked for other organisations into the firm, number one, and two, what sort of qualifications would you be looking for? So, so the first, the, to the first question, absolutely, because in an in an ideal world, you'd have enough talent to move through an organisation to deal with all the people that leave of their own volition or retire or whatever. Um, it's never quite as simple as that. And there will be certain roles where we don't, we don't, haven't got the skill set to be able to funnel those individuals through into the vacancies that are created. So what we will then do is we'll go into the market and, and look for people. Um, equally, if you're setting up a new line of business, you would probably want people that had to be involved in that line of business before. So we'll go out to the market and hire them. So experience from other firms is critically important, and we will. So when I talked about 500 people that we take in every year between 18 and 24, 25, 26. Um, the, the, the ones aged 23 to 26 aren't all coming out of university, they're coming out of other jobs, the vast majority are coming out of other roles. So we are taking on people every year that have got work experience in other firms. But equally, we're taking on a lot of people that are leaving school or university. The qualifications that we're looking for would typically be uh, pretty directly relevant to the job that was being done. Um, and and that, actually, the way I would view it is rather less about qualifications and more about experience and attitude. So when I'm hiring people, I, the first thing I do is look for whether they've got the right attitude or not. So if you're listening intently and you're asking me questions and I'm getting eye contact from you, or if you're sitting down there writing notes or dozing off or looking out the window, it's kind of easy for me to start to say, well, there's some people in here I would, I would rather, and my, and my intuition is telling me they might be the people for me. So that's about, that's about attitude for me, and that's about all those kind of things. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very much believer that, that you do recognize fairly quickly in someone whether or not they're extolling the right, but the right, the real determination and that's what I'm willing to will be successful. If you had a highly skilled person, um, a person that's not got so much skill but much more potential, would you go for the person who may not that many qualifications? I'd go for potential every time. I'd go for attitude and potential every time. You, you can, somebody with the right attitude can be taught. Somebody with the wrong attitude that might well be brilliant academically can't be because they haven't got the right attitude they don't have it. So, that, that, to my mind, is that you, when you go in and you go in for your first job interview, um, you probably have about that long to make a first impression. And, and whilst all the books will tell all the employers that you should never do that, human nature will make sure that it does. There was something on the I read. I was listening to the radio um, just last week. Um, and I, I, it was on it was on my my radio station four four three three in Edinburgh, and the, the the assertion was being made that you've got thirteen seconds to convince an employer that you are the right person for them. Thirteen seconds. By that time, somewhere in here, they've made up their mind. I, I, I'm not sure I believe that, but that was an assertion that someone was making. So it's critically important. But that, that, that initial interaction that you have when you're walking with them up the stairs or you're, whatever you're doing, that, that, there is, that, that that's, an, that's a very important part of the interview. So that's when your attitude comes out. That's when your personality comes out. Make sure that you get across those sorts of things, I would say, very, very quickly in any interaction that you're having with a prospective employer. But yeah, I, I've, I've, my, I would say that those people that I've failed with have probably been the ones that have come with a great track record um, of work and academia, and those that I have um, I've been really successful with are those that I've said, see that guy there, that woman there, they've got something special, they're really the right person for me. And more often than not, it's the latter ones that people. I don't know if that's what you wanted to hear. <laughs> I can only tell you what how, how I think. Okay, can I ask a question? Sure. It's, uh, it's number six. It's, we spoke a lot. <laughs> just, I've just read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
If I had the money, which division of the business would be worth buying? <laughs> <laughs> grounds that I'll incriminate myself if I was to answer it honestly. Um, <laughs> no, it won't. It wouldn't be. No, it would. It, I'll be very careful about how I phrase it. I know. Um, I don't have No, no, no. <laughs> but, I, but I think. So if, if if I was to give a more generic answer to it, I think if you've got a strong market position in any market that you operate, in, so the Royal Bank is a strong market position in Scotland a strong market position in England um, and you've, you get to the point where you can say well look this is this is a really good market position we've got really good products and services that we're making available to our customers this is a profitable business but it's, there's value in it for the customers as well as value in it for the bank and that's probably a good place to start when we've had to close businesses down, so we've closed down our business in Vietnam, we've closed down our business in Kazakhstan, we've closed down our business in Russia. The reason that we close them down is that they don't have scale. They don't really have the because you've got to set, you've got a huge amount of money to set up business, and we had a branch in Siberia for to support our oil and gas companies that were exploring uh, the raw materials in there. Um, and and the reality is that you need to spend a fortune to put a branch into Siberia uh, with all the connectivity back to the UK and, and making sure the payments are going around and all the rest of it. You've got to put people on the ground and you don't have very many customers at the end of the day. So, you know, when you start to think about where have you got real density, it's it's in Glasgow, it's in Edinburgh, uh, it's in Aberdeen, it's in the big cities in England where you've got density of people, density of branches and a good market position. So the, those are the sort of things that you know, pe people have, people Business uh, gurus have said that, that, that you have to be number one or number two in a market to make a good economic return. So we were number five or number six in, in, uh, in the Far East, in the Middle East. That didn't, it didn't make any sense for us to continue there. But our aspiration is to be number one for trust and advocacy in, uh, and service in the UK. And if we can achieve that, then that will be a very valuable business going into the future. So the retail, you feel the retail section in the bank so is small, well, small, so, so small business is part of retail. So you know, they, they, many of your, uh, you'll know that many of your family members run small businesses. Um, you, if you, if, so by small businesses, I mean businesses that are turning over up to two million. That's all part of retail because the requirements of small business and retail customers, commercial end, are relatively similar. A lot of things to say it's a lot of manual payments need to get paid. So we, 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 I would include small business. I wouldn't include the larger businesses within that group. They're in a separate division altogether. But uh, family owned businesses, I would include them in the retail space. Yeah. Yeah. Can you also mention this part of RBS is rebuilding their reputation? Mm -hmm. and, uh, they no longer were offering like, uh, balance transfers uh, offers for new customers, etc. The yeah. existing customer would get essentially get the same deal. Yeah. Has that cost the bank money? Fortunate. A fortune. Fortune. Yeah. So if you if you can go if you've got a five hundred pound credit card bill and you can't afford to pay it off and you're paying thirty percent interest on it, um, you one thing you can do is you can move it to another bank that's going to give you interest free for. Um, and e even if you even if you want to go to get a new credit card, if you know that you're going to get interest free for a period of time, then you're more likely to go there, um, and you're less likely to come to us because we'll charge you interest. Even though our interest rates are very much more competitive than other banks, because we charge from day one, um, it, we're, yeah, many customers are not are not uh, prepared to accept that they would ra much rather transfer the money to another. Uh, company that's going to give you it for nothing for a few years. What tends to happen, and the reason that it makes money for those banks that do it, is that if you, if you get a two-year interest-free period, um, typically they, the, um, the customers that do that will either forget or just won't be anything about it, and then, and then they start paying exorbitant amounts of interest, which we just come to the conclusion that that wasn't fair. Uh, 
but it's killing it's killing the credit card business at the moment. But we still believe it's the right thing to do. Um, but, but there are consequences or unintended consequences for things that you decide to do. But I think if you believe fundamentally that the market needs to change and that we are the market leader, then we think that's the right. But yeah, it, it, it's costing us money. Yeah, there's no doubt it's costing us money. And your market research your feedback from customers to talk about existing customers. You said that you were happy you're doing So I think, I think the existing customers are happy with it because they're now, they're now they're saying, well, look, we, we're, we know that people that are walking in the door are not getting a better deal than us and we've been with you for 10 or 15 or 20 years. So that's embedding a good relationship with existing customers and that ultimately is where we believe their trust will be restored to say that we've been completely transparent about this. We want everybody to get the same deal. We're not giving new customers a better deal than existing customers. Um, so so there is, there's an advocacy benefit, but there's a P&L pit at the front end. And um, that's just something that we have to accept. So there's not many customers coming in and getting credit cards from us. We just have to accept that. But ultimately, more and more of our customers think it's the right thing to do. So our market research is telling us that they think this is the right thing to do, so they're much more likely to, to stick with us. Can I ask a quick mm. question? Sure. Um, what has been done to target uh, this age group mm. in terms of becoming responsible savers? Mm. We do a lot of work in, in not schools, not, not, not mm. like this, but with, uh, with, um, with savings advice. Now, I, I can say a lot of work, but then again, if they haven't been here, then they haven't. That maybe there more needs to be done. But yeah, there's there's a, there's a group of people that will go around schools and and, uh, and businesses and talk about the importance of budgeting. It's critically important that you understand about you know when heavens, I know how difficult it, it can be, and I, rem I remember the days. I'm, for, I'm fortunate enough now that I don't have uh, you know I don't have to worry so much about when the bills are coming in because I've been around long enough to have saved some money. But um, you know, when, when I was studying out and I bought my first flat, um, it was extraordinarily difficult and I wish I'd had a bit of advice then as to how, how to make it work, or even better, get, get some advice when I was 15, 16, 17 years old as to how to save. So yes, I, I, it, 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 there's, a, there's a paucity of information out there, I would recognise that, but we are trying to get out and about, out and about amongst young people to try and explain to them the benefits of uh, a savings culture because um, you know, it's critically important. But you know, when the bills start to come in, you, all of a sudden you have to deal with, deal with them in a very different way than you've had to when the bills are being paid for you. Any more interesting ones on this list? Was a um, question did you get a question, Alan? Um, who's your biggest rival? Rival? Yeah, you are. Biggest competitor? A rival. <laughs> um, so ri rivalry, you, you would typically say rivalry was between two individuals than, uh, than two, than two uh, compared to the two refer to rivals and comments as well. But the, the you know, the, our chief executive Ross McEwen um, has, has said on a number of occasions that uh, we're not very good at it in this country. And that he has not seen. So he came from New Zealand, but he worked in Australia. He came over from uh, he came over from an Australian bank in 2012, and he observed very quickly that uh, there was no banks particularly good at in this country, and that what he is bringing some of the uh, some of the things that I talked about this morning is what things that he's brought to to the UK market. So. I don't think, if I, if I believe that, I've got, to, I've got to believe that he's seen better business models in Australia and New Zealand, then you know, we, we all need to lift our gear. Uh, I don't think anybody necessarily would be saying this head and shoulders above the rest, where you know, we, we've got an awful lot to do to be good at customer service, I think. So, yeah, if, if you mean who's the biggest competitor, well, the Bank of Scotland and the Royal Bank have been competitors for nearly 300 years um, and you know, that, in Scotland that goes the, the, two, the two biggest banks and that's where the, the rivalry if, if, to use your description of would, would exist in Britain. Any more 
was the highest salary you could earn? Um, well, as a matter of public record, um, the, uh, the, the, the list we list out the top five, top five people. Ross McEwen is paid a million pounds a year. Um, he, he, he is also entitled to a role-based allowance on top of that, which he has declined. Um, and he's also entitled to a bonus on top of that, which he has declined to take until such times we're paying the, the dividends to shareholders. And he also has a long-term share incentive. Um, so he would be given shares that would best become his after five, six, and seven years. So it is, he doesn't get the money, it gets deferred for five, six, and seven years. So um, you, you, I, would, I would say it would be in the region of, in the region of one and a half million. The, but if you were to look at the big companies in Scotland, there's not many of those. Um, Standard Life, David Nish left Standard Life last year, Keith Skier took over. I think David earned about four and a half million in his final year of Standard Life. So you know, the Royal Bank does not pay as much as some of the biggest, bigger financial companies for the very reasons that I've explained to you. Is that the Treasury's insistence? No, it's not. It's, it's the board's. It's the board. Uh, the board have decided to do it that way. And Ross has been very clear that he, that he didn't want to have in his first two years. He didn't want any additional financial compensation over the body salary because it, in front it gets the headline. He wanted to the energies to be focused on internally and externally to customers rather than being about it. But chief executives of um, of the, the hundred biggest companies, that would be that would be pretty much what the chief executives of the hundred biggest companies in the UK would get. One, but there's a the, 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 the pyramid is like that. It's not like everybody that's uh, that's one or two levels below the chief executive gets that sort of money. I can, I can assure you that's the case. Uh, once you go two or three levels below, uh, I, mean, I, th I still think it's, it can be. It's still a pretty well paid job, and the those that have got reasonable degree of um, of, of seniority will, will earn substantially above the national average. So, you know, the financial ser I think financial services needs to go through a correction because I don't think for all that we do, uh, I still think there's too much goes out to the employees and not enough gets reinvested in the business. And and that that is changing over time. And for example, I was I was paid a lot more in 2007, 2008. I am today. Uh, and that's just been a correction that's happened all the time. Has you been like with all this for so long? What what do you do for service? Do you provide your customers for them to for your bank to be unique and not like other banks? I I think I'll just go back. To, so I think I think it's really quite difficult to differentiate on financial services because there's no IP. There's no there's no you're not creating something that can just be, um, it's not like a drug where you can you know, protect your rights to a, a, a new drug for 15 or 20 years. So it's not like, a, there's no patents. If you come up with a new product, it can be copied immediately. Um, the, the, um, so the, the real intelligence is in IT. So you might create competitive advantages through having better IT systems and you're able to do it. But, but, it's, but it's, it's really quite difficult to, to differentiate yourself uh, with, with customers and, and therefore it's the human interaction that's going to differentiate and the culture that exists. So I had uh, I was um, down in Wales at the weekend and I went to a brand new hotel in Cardiff Bay and it was £68 for the four of us, for the uh, two kids and, and my wife and I. Um, and it was a fantastic deal, and the ser when we walked in, the service was absolutely fantastic. Uh, the staff were good, um, they made you feel welcome, the rooms were clean, it was just a terrific experience. And it's easy to give examples of where we've all had good experiences of those things that you can feel in touch. It's a lot more difficult to feel good about somebody managing your money for you. Um, and, and, and so therefore, you know, that, that's a real challenge, and I'll just go back to how do you differentiate yourself Well, the way that I described zero balance transfers and new customers not getting a better deal than, 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 uh, than 
loyal customers is the sort of thing that we're, we're trying to do as much as anything else. Who wants to know about the Who, who asked the question about Fred Goodwood? <laughs> he went to school just down the road. As did I, incidentally. We went to the same school. That doesn't, that doesn't put us into the same bracket. <laughs> He was an autocratic leader who stopped listening to viewpoints not in agreement with his own. Is that a fair picture? In other words, where the people inside RBS who felt the country was taking too many risks and spoke out were sorry. In other words, where their people inside RBS who felt the country was taking too many risks and spoke out about their concern. I'm not sure. I think if, if that question had been and didn't speak out about their concerns then I would certainly say that that was absolutely the case. So yes, he was autocratic. Um, he, he's, been, he's been painted perhaps slightly unfairly uh, over, over the last years. But um, the, is, that, is, that, is that still running? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You can stop it. No, 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 no. Um, one, what, 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 when you... When you have an experience and you go through a life experience, you, 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 can, you make a decision as to whether or not you want to rectify the mistakes that you've made or not. Um, and you know, I, I think one of the things that you could have done was come out and spoken about this experience and explain to people why you made the decisions that you made. Um, but, it, but it hasn't done, and I think, I think that's unfortunate. So yes, he was, he was an autocratic leader, but then again, if you were to look at many of the companies, that, uh, many of the biggest companies in this country, um, they, 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 will, they will also have pretty autocratic leaders because they don't get to the top of organizations unless they're prepared to be quite determined to get there. So it's not uncommon to have autocratic leaders in the country. Um, it's, it's important equally you know, that you have a create a culture where if people don't like what they see or like what they hear, that they're a willing a recipient of that kind of internal advice. And were the boards receptive to um, the size of the board? So I'm, I'm, I'm on the Scottish board. I chair the Scottish board, so it's, that, that's just the board in Scotland as opposed to the, the whole of the Royal Alliance. And my, my focus of attention is very much in Scotland. I mean, there's. Um, but, but the, the, it's very, very difficult to determine what went on behind, behind closed doors. What I've heard is that um, Red always said that if non-exec directors, so you have executive directors which were, they sat on the board which were Goodwin and, um, and the finance director, and the non-exec directors were people typically that hadn't worked for the organisation before, they brought their skills and experiences from outside the company and challenged the chief executive about his strategy. Um, and my understanding was that uh, he was an open book in terms of uh, willingness to speak to non-exec directors and allow them access to, to various parts of the business. So that, that's, that's, but that's second hand, not getting any first time experience. The kind of media picture is that the success of the NatWest deal made for him and sort of people at the very top quite right headstrong. I think I think that's right. So you you um, you know if, you, if if you get to a point where you everybody's lauding you as a great success, so undoubtedly we all we, you know, when, when people say good things about you and write good things about you and you're you're nominated as Forbes Businessman of the Year globally, you kind of you know we all think wow that's fantastic. I must, some of this must be true. <laughs> and I think there's an inevitability that if people are continually telling you you greatest things in sliced bread, that you actually start to believe it. And the question is whether or not you can keep your feet in your grip on the ground when you believe this, or whether or not you start to get your head lifted above the clouds. And I think if you're, if you're well grounded, it's, it's, then, it's, then it's a nice to have to be told that you're good at what you do, whatever, whatever, you, whatever you are in an organisation. I think it's critically important that, that you're well grounded and keep your feet in the ground and you're able to, to deal with whatever plaudits come your way. because. You kind of know, or I certainly know that when you get plaudits, and you guys must know this as well, when you get plaudits one day, you can be rest assured there's some criticism coming around the corner. And 
And if you're not able to, to accept the criticism, then that's not a great place for any of us to be. How are we doing? Any more? Any of these, do you have these questions? Anybody would like to ask any of them? I just with a rough scene, I think. <laughs> William, have you got a question? How have external factors impacted? Sorry, say that again. Oh, that's a big question. Um, so external, so so legislation. I'd, I'd put, I'd, I'd use the word regulation rather than legislation because there aren't many laws that are passed by the government in relation to the way that we do things. But, but there is a regulator, and and there's a lot of people who have been critical of the regulatory environment in 2005, 2006, 2007, because, and, and, and you know, I, I think it, was, it would be fair to observe that um, Gordon Brown, when he was Prime Minister, said that he wanted to have a more laissez-faire approach to regulation in the UK. And, and, and with the benefit of hindsight, and it's only with the benefit of hindsight, uh, we would recognise that perhaps that was not the right thing to say when the economy was growing like this. It was probably the right thing to say that we need to understand what's happening with the growth in, in banks' balance sheets and we need to become more actively involved in what's really going on in the regulated needs to take a great deal more interest. Unfortunately, the balloon went pop before the regulator's done, so inevitably what's happened now is that we get an overreaction in regulation, which arguably, when the banks are sorting themselves out, is, is overkill, but, but, but it's like a pendulum. There wasn't enough when we should have had it, and now there's arguably too much when we don't need it because we're sorting it ourselves. So I, I think it's absolutely right that we retain a very significant amount of regulation in the banking industry because you know we haven't done a particularly good job in regulating ourselves. So it's absolutely right that people are satisfied that we are, we've got the right controls and the right uh, the right lending practices in place, and that we're doing the right things by customers. Um, but, but there is quite a, an intrusive regulatory environment that exists in, in this country at the present time, and that ain't going to change anytime soon. Uh, you, you mentioned regulation and external. Was that what you meant by external factors? Thank you. Questions? I was just wondering, Ken, you spoke about the um, recruitment and career development. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, like, how do you instill custom, the customer service philosophy of RBS to its special new staff? How does that have an impact? Because they all work in a branch, say, or. So I, I think it's. It, it, one of the things that we don't really speak a lot about is the fact that of the 50,000 people that work in the UK, 49,000, um, 49,500, um, so that, of that sort of order of magnitude, really didn't have anything to do with what went wrong. It's the senior guys like me that got a lot wrong. Um, and, and, and I determined I wanted to stay around to try and fix some of the things that had not gone the way they should have done. Um, so, but the people working in branches have just continued to go about their business and continued to look after their customers, to my mind, fantastically well for a long, long period. Right through this whole period, they've just got on with it, despite the fact that were lobbing bricks at branch staff and all the rest of it. It really had nothing to do with the men and women and young men and women in, in the network right throughout the whole country. And, and I think we, we perhaps in the senior management haven't recognised that. So, you know, the, 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 they've gone about their work and done a fantastic job. Um, now you want to talk a little bit more about the recruitment. 
Notice how you instilled the customer service oh, philosophical approach. So I, I, I don't think it's really changed fundamentally. Yeah. From the, because you know, the, the, we're probably better now at recognising those people that work in our branches that go the extra mile. You know, when the, when the old woman or the old man comes into the branch and then forgets where they live. You know, we, we, there's not very many um, companies would uh, have employees who would want them to take that old man or that old lady home and make sure they got safely into the house. If you went to Curry's and you're trying to buy a telly or you're buying a whatever you buy in Curry's and then somebody doesn't feel very well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect somebody from Curry's to be then saying, well, we'll see if we can get you home. But there is something about the relationship between local communities and banks now that is incredibly powerful but just hasn't really been put out there to be celebrated and for lots of reasons that we can well understand, we don't just get on with it. And many of the people in the branches have just continued to serve their customers extraordinarily well. And these, these people are typically on not much more than minimum wage, um, but they do a fantastic job for their customers. And, and so therefore the, the need to embed a, a culture with them has been, any, any sort of change in culture has been very, very straightforward because they've been totally committed to their customers right throughout the uh, period of, um, from, from 2008. So I, I, you know, I don't have any concerns about that. Um, one thing that they're not doing, one thing that's changed is for, for the customer advisors is that they don't have targets for selling them. And that's really where you know, some of them, and it wasn't them that was doing anything wrong, it was the fact that it was management that were saying, well, you've got to sell a certain number of this or a certain number of that, or I've got one of these today, where they didn't really think about what the customer needed. It was much more about making sure we hit sales targets. That, that was fundamentally flawed. And so it's, we now need to meet needs. We need to identify needs, because we, you know, we need to make money at the end of the day, but it needs to be much more around what does the customer actually need, and can we, can we find one of our products that would actually match on to solve that need for them? So for example, if we know that there are house insurances coming up for renewal, we would say, well, we've got, a, we've got something here that we should talk to our people and see whether or not we can be competitive, rather than say, some of you will sign you up for a uh, house insurance product, we would actually invite them to make contact, but without any kind of sales pitch. It's that. So that's the cultural change that needs to take place in production. But that, that was a relative thing to do. Has there been any change in, say, what were the stress or anything like that? Or uh, staff retention or absenteeism with that removal? Is it too early to say? It, it's um, around the edges, undoubtedly, but not, not material. Questions? Keep to go. Keep to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'd just like to, you to put your hands together for Ken Barclay.